Welcome to the RSP cast or welcome to the RSP film room. Whichever one you decide to tune this into. We hope you did the video one though cuz then you get to see you know, get to see Mark Schofield and you know, yes, with the hand size. Doing the hand size cuz we're looking at the one and only Kenny Pickett this week. The can he play in the northern climbs? Can the pit quarterback play in Pittsburgh across the the It's a head scratcher, man. You know, I know. He's buried in Durant's tomb. I know, I know exactly. So it's one of those questions, though. It's it's kind of like you know, did you pay attention to the Jim to the Aaron Rodgers Instagram last night? Right. Well, you know, it's kind of a, on that level. Um, but you know, we love doing this. We love watching films. So we're gonna look at Kenny Pickett, a lot of people's number one quarterback prospect. Um, I will say I have him ranked number one right now, but it's so close, and I'm honestly about. 85 percent 90 percent sure he won't be my number one quarterback in this class how about you mark where whereabouts do you have him i mean i think he's top three four for sure i mean he's near the top this is honestly matt and i've really been kicking this around in my head the past couple of days now if there was a year where i was going to say you know what i'm not ranking these guys i'm going to tier them and I'm going to give you, like, these are your four, like, pro-ready, safe guys. And here's how I'll rank those within that tier. Here are your four, like, lottery picks, boom bust. If you get it right, they could explode. But if not, it could look poorly. These are those four guys. And here's how I'd rank those within that tier. I mean, he's probably in that former tier of the guys that I think are you know, you could see this guy having a long career in the NFL. You could see from what he does from a mental perspective and a, a decision-making perspective that working out in the NFL. And so in that tier, he's probably one or two. Um, now, how would you then mesh those two? I don't know. Um, it, I, I think it's like if you want the lottery pick, you might prefer Malik Willis. If you want the safe option, you might prefer Kenny Pickett. And, and so this might be the year that I finally say enough with rankings. I'm going to tier these guys. And in that tier of safe guys, yeah, he's one or two in that group. You might not like that guy, but if you do, this is the guy for you. And just to add a little spice to this tier conversation, how about the addition of, I don't want to come anywhere near either of those two guys you just mentioned. That's kind of an answer I'm starting to have some thoughts about. Yeah, I mean, it's such a strange class. And... As we start thinking about free agency, I'm in the middle of doing, you know, free agency rankings and tiers for USA Today. And you see a Jameis Winston, you see a Teddy Bridgewater as potential available free agent options. And if you're a team that's like close, I could see teams saying, you know what, I'll give Jameis a one year deal. And then maybe I'll draft one of these guys. But I I really think this might be a year that NFL teams decide. I'm going to go all in on a veteran option. I don't know about any of these guys. I'll let somebody else do that. And if it ends up that Carolina or Atlanta drafts Malik Willis and he pans out, well, great. But I don't want to be the one to have to make that decision. And, you know, you may say whatever you want about that. You may say you'd rather have a Malik Willis than a Teddy Bridgewater or Jamison. That's fine. But this just seems to me, Matt, like a a, a draft cycle where decision makers are going to say, I'd rather go with – a Jimmy Garoppolo via trade or Jameis Winston, then put all my eggs in the Desmond Ritter or the Kenny Pickett or the Malik Willis basket. This would be a nice thing to happen, and I doubt it will, Mark, but it would be wonderful if the NFL looks at this and it spawns the, maybe we shouldn't draft a quarterback in the first round. Maybe we should let them sit a couple years, and then we can do something with them, and then they'll bear fruit, and they might turn out to be better than some of the guys we usually draft in the first round who we think are can't miss, who miss wildly. Um, so, you know, like the Drew Locke, Mitchell Trubisky type of, you know, Baker Mayfield, if you want to add him in there, type of picks. There are a lot of these guys who could be as good or better, who could definitely be better than those players have been. But I fear that because they're going to get drafted in the first round, it may turn out to be those three plus a Daniel Jones type of situation and all of this where you're just kind of looking back three years later with a new GM, new coaching staff, and going, what do we do with this guy? You know? I, I was having this discussion on another show um, earlier this week, Matt, 
And I part of me wonders if this is the year that the veterans command the attention for the quarterback needy teams, right? Like a Pittsburgh. They might say, look, we'll, we'll go a Garoppolo route for a Carolina. They've already been calling about Kirk Cousins. Like, and so you might see, yeah, four quarterbacks come off the board in the first round, but instead of, you know, six to Carolina, it's 26 to Tennessee. The teams that are at the end of the draft that might have an opportunity to grab a flyer on a quarterback, but without the need to play them right away, this might be a year that's catering to that kind of draft capital expenditure. So maybe we get something like that by proxy. And I the think- teams that are QB needy solve it via veterans, and we ought, we get this sort of developmental route. It's a fantastic point, Mark, and I hope it happens because when I look at my scores for these players, I I'm pretty sure I'll have four, if not five, quarterbacks that I that the score is going to be so tight that it's going to go look at you and say if someone goes, I think this guy should be number one, I'm going to go, I can see that, and then if they can go through five guys and I can say that because right now I think I have three guys with less than a point separating them. Yeah, I mean it's and and but none of them are what I would have put in my top three or top four last year. But doesn't mean, but they're above, they're above Zach Wilson for me, um, who was a starter last year. So, I mean, you know, whether you liked him or not, you know, he certainly, I certainly understood why teams went there, even if I didn't agree. So let's take a look at Kenny Pickett because, you know, lots of fun things to look at his tape. That's for sure. It's a fun class to watch. I I will, that's the first thing we'll look at here. So, what do we have here to begin with, Mark? Ooh. Well, you get a two-by-two two concept. And I, I think sort of full disclosure, I know Kenny's private quarterback coach, Tony Rossiopi. I've known him for years. Um, I've talked with Tony a lot. Um, Tony's been talking to me about Kenny for a while now. Um, so I did want to put that out there. Um, this here, two-by-two, two, you get sort of your smash look. Pittsburgh loves to go smash to one side, a different concept to the other. So you get your smash to the left, you get your post out to the right side of the field, too high structure, looks to be quarters with the way that curl flat defenders leak into the outside. And I just love how he uses his eyes here because he opens to the left of the smash. You see the out route is covered by the curl flat defender, the linebacker leaking to the out. You'll see that corner sinking to get depth under the deeper out route. And he uses his eyes to get that play side, that smash side safety to open his hips right there. And then he throws the post backside. And it's just, uh, you know, the more I watch quarterbacks, the more I become enthralled when they can move a defender just a couple of steps and create space. Yeah. And again, it's, this is one of those that what's nice is there's a lot going on from the, the drop standpoint, you know, yeah. during the drop. Now, when it comes time to throw or no throw, I'd say it's pretty easy. Like right here. Yeah. This is wide open and with the yeah. turn of the back there. But, again, he's got to fit it over uh, an underneath defender here. And I, th- I don't think he's going to have any problem with that, what the distance this is. But it's a beautiful throw. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I like the idea and the, the way he sort of creates space. He's got a little bit of traffic at his feet to do this because you get, you know, guard sort of pushed back into his lap a little bit there. Um, but it's just – it's good execution – Standard route concept, get into sort of that, if you want to call it his second or his third read. And I like how he applies some information pre-snap too, because that receiver that's on the zero to the left, it's flexed out to the left, that's a tight end. And that's a corner to the boundary outside of him. So he knows it's going to be probably some sort of zone coverage unless they're taking a corner and putting him on a tight end. So he knows he's going to have a zone coverage to work against. And then he opens to the smash side, short side of the field. That's where your eyes will go first, sees how the coverage is unfolded, moves to the safety, makes a good throw. Well done. And one of the things that I think you noted very well is that there is a little bit of interior pressure um, pushing the pocket back a bit. And I find, and we're going to, this is going to kind of foreshadow some of the things we'll see later, but I find that when he feels pressure that's tightening, that, that is blocked, he's fine. When he sees pressure that's unblocked that's when things can go a little haywire for him we'll talk about that in a little bit but you know moving forward here you get your nice little read the mesh there yep it's kind of the same thing but now he's got you know single high safety to work with 
So he opens again left. You've got a similar little smash kind of look where you've got, you know, two on the corner, one on the hitch. And you get a divide concept out of a Y, Y win. Opens to the left. Safety moves a couple of steps. And then I love where he puts this throw. You know, because he puts it low. That's a tight end working against the safety. Put it a little bit low to protect him so he doesn't get blown off. Yep, to Lance Kroll, the destroyer, right yeah. there. There you go. Right. Very good. Not, and if that's not an 80s name for a tight end, I don't know no, what it's is. perfect. Exactly. So, and he's got the mullet to match. So, yeah. you know, I... I you think see that... their eyes left, come right. A little bit of a tougher layer here. You've got that same linebacker, number three underneath, but it's a shorter throw, so he's got to get the trajectory right on this. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, got to be happy with that. That's beautiful work. Now, I think it ended up getting ruled down at the one, but still, nice, nice play. Yeah. I love this. McVay, and I know we talked about this recently, McVay talked about how Stafford was able to solve problems post-snap. If you can spin this back to where before the ball gets – it's third and 19. You've got that linebacker, number 10, cheating down to the B gap between the right guard, right tackle, okay? That receiver in the slot, that's Addison. They gump that linebacker off to basically double him. Pittsburgh's trying to run a flood to the left with Addison on the over. You get a post route. You get the tight end leaking on the shallow. That's all taken away. They basically double Addison with that linebacker. So now what does he do? Against this Tampa two look, hit the backside dick. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah. And again, I like this play because it's third and nineteen. You've got to solve a problem. You're not expecting them to double him off the line, but they do that. So you get to the backside dig, and he throttles him down again, protecting his guy. You see that flash of color, throttle him down, put him on the frame, get yourself into a manageable fourth and one situation. That's nice work, and you know that gives you. That's a good contrast to a guy that, you know, in a meeting we were in recently, you know, recently uh -huh. together, you know, yeah. in contrast to a guy like Jalen Hurts, who, yeah. as you've noted, is someone that pre-snap, post-snap, when there's a post-snap surprise, sometimes things unravel for him. So this is a good example of, of someone where with the post-snap here, he has an answer to it, at least in this yeah. situation. And it's a nice answer for sure. And you can see, you know, you can use him in a variety of, um, alignments just like most quarterbacks even though we see a lot of the spread look he can take three five seven step drops yep. he's someone that's going to be able to fire from that range and do a good job with it he can he gives you mobility which we'll see later to to be able to you know throw on the move and and execute the rollout game so he's offensively diverse you know yeah or, or versatile in that sense all right so we got ourselves the dig route right here yep, another dig route and again you know, layered throw, middle of the field, love the read. You know, Mills concept, you've got two on the post, one on the dig. You see the safety stay deep as they rotate this to single high, so you know you're high, low on him. You're not getting that post route. With that safety sitting at the 25, no receiver is getting over the top of him. Yeah. So anticipation throw on the dig. See the ball's already coming out. Yeah. He doesn't need to wait to see it. And this is an improvement upon what he did earlier in the year yes. because if you watch him against Tennessee, he was inconsistent with this. And I'll show that and I'll be able to skip over it fairly fast now because we've seen this against Miami as a good example is where he had one play where he was really kind of late, didn't throw the dig at all that he should have. And the next one he was late to get confirmation on the dig on the very next play. So you could see he was still kind of warming up to the task there. But this one, it looks like someone who's in like midseason form. Yeah. Yeah, so very yeah, nice. I, I really like this this play there. All right, so, yeah, moving forward. Again, and, you know, you can see the push of the pocket here. Does yep. a good job being able to throw this ball. And he's thrown with his feet parallel. Yeah, because he has to step play. away from it. Now, I got a clip later you, you, that we can talk about the armor bit. But here, certainly got enough juice. Yeah. Yeah, and I think... You know, I'm going to throw out a player that, you know, a lot of people might say oof because they just think of the result and not the actual mechanics of the player and what he was as a prospect. But I see a lot of Jake Cutler in, in, in Kenny Pickett in yeah. terms of, like, how he moves, what he can do in the positive realm of creating, what he does when he reads the field well. Um, maybe the arm strength is – the arm strength's good enough, that's for sure. Yeah. 
I, you know, it may not be Cutler's arm, but it's certainly there's some things that remind you of that, the creativity, the solutions that he can come up with on and off platform. All right, a little check down here. Yeah. This is nice. You see everything pretty much over the top taken care of. Doesn't yep. waste any time. It comes right to it. You know, quick read, quick decision, quick throw. I mean, it's, again, you're going to have to have these moments as a quarterback where they're going to drop seven, they're going to drop eight, they're going to try to keep everything in front of them. So can you just take what they give you or are you going to try to force the issue? Yeah. And this is the fascinating thing. I love the way that we do this film room, Mark, because we don't talk about the plays right. that we pick out. And for years, it seems like we always have like two or three of the same plays. So far, I don't think you and I have any of the same plays no. from either of the two players and, and that I we've think watched that this far. that to this class being fun. Yes. Because there's a lot of stuff you could pick out. Like last year when we were doing Mac Jones, it was like we had like five or six of the same plays. Yeah. Yeah, like this, this is a wildly different group. Yes, it is, and so it's it's really entertaining. But it's showing some of the same things, but it's also enlightening some things with points that we each are going to make. Because, like, again, this is another one where you, he doesn't see any flash of white. Everything's like you know, basically blue and gold moving at him. And when he sees his own flashes of color moving near him, he's fine. He's a rocket yeah. in the pocket. And, and that's nice when it comes to plays getting compressed or pockets getting compressed. He's comfortable with that. So that's that's a good expression of the of his pocket presence that I think is important to note, especially in light of what will be to come. This is, again, that, that dig route anticipation, middle of the field. Yeah. A right little there. high. And, I mean, this is where... I know there's going to be, because this was a bit of a colder, rawer day yeah. in Pittsburgh, and you see the high throw. People will start saying, is it a hand size thing? You know, so this is the opening to that discussion. But again, layered dig route, anticipation, middle of the field. He's not somebody that's afraid to. I know when we talked about Corral, we referenced Herbert. He's certainly not somebody afraid to attack the middle of the field. He's asked to attack the middle of the field a little bit more. And I also love the eyes and the feet here. You know, because he almost sets up like he's going to throw to the boundary. And you got that underneath yeah. hook curl defender to navigate. That guy opens just a little bit, allows that receiver to get underneath that. I mean, over the top of him to the inside. Yeah. So it's a really good job of manipulation. Beautiful. I mean, listen, as long as the, the Pittsburgh Pigeons don't poop on the ball, I think he'll be yeah, okay. Yeah, he'll be okay. Yeah, you know. No, if they're prone to do that, we don't know, but... Right. Nice little hole there to throw to, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's move forward. Another Miami clip here. Yeah, this one, you know, man coverage, throwing the over. Timing is good. But this is one where you start to say, okay, does he have an elite arm? Yeah. Because you could see this hand is just enough for that corner to get under it. I mean, I think he has an NFL arm. I'm not worried about him from an arm talent perspective. But, but this, this is... just opens the door to the, okay, maybe it's not a lead, but it's an NFL arm. So now you start thinking, I, I, uh, you know, Deshaun Watson has other issues right now. But I remember one of the knocks on Watson was throws outside the numbers. You need to be made with timing, anticipation, he doesn't have the ability right now to just drive them in there. Yeah. And I yeah. think you see that here. Exactly. And this is, let's talk about this because yesterday I was looking at Bailey Zappi and, and we had, and I had a reader who we had a, a really nice conversation throughout the day on Twitter about Bailey Zappi. And I was pointing out to him that he doesn't really drive throws on that level. Just as what we described. And this is a good example of that. Um, and I was trying to point out here, if you want to be helpful, find some throws for me that do this and try to describe it. And we went through the day as kind of an exercise doing that. And he was like, okay, I see your point, you know? Yeah. And, and it was like, this is one of those. And, but he brought up miles per hour, you know, the whole senior bowl miles per hour and how Bailey Zappi, Malik Willis, Kenny Pickett, and I believe one other player is probably Ritter who had 
over 70 miles per hour on their on that. How come that doesn't apply to this directly? Well, because again, it's one thing when you're throwing, you know, a, a curl to an off man coverage defender and you can dial up ridiculous RPMs. This is something a little bit different. You've got a target moving away from you. You're rolling to your right a little bit, middle of the field throw to a throw outside the numbers with lots of moving points of coverage. Like, you know, pure miles per hour, it's an interesting data point, but this isn't a throw that has 70 miles per hour on it. Like, so it's one thing to spin it on a controlled environment. It's another thing to know you've got to dial it up and do it in a game environment. And so while Kenny Pickett might have the ability to do that in one setting, you'd like to see him translate that to a setting like this, where, you know, you've got to drill that in there. Now, it opens the door to maybe he doesn't think he needs to. Maybe he doesn't see, think this guy can close. Okay. Maybe that's okay on Saturday. It won't be okay on Sundays. Yeah. And, you know, an NFL corner is certainly going to close. So you better be able to dial that up when you need to. Yeah. And this is the point that he's reading, has to read this and make the decision. Yeah. So I can see why he, he may think I've got this because of the position of the defender, but at the same time, look how much ground's made up. And right. Miami, whether they play well or not, often fields, often recruits NFL caliber athletes for sure. Yep. You know, there's a lot of NFL caliber athletes at the University of Miami um, year in and year out, even if they're not NFL caliber players these days. Um, you know, I, as a whole, not saying, you know, there's some awesome examples where they are. But, uh, but yeah, this is one of those that I've certainly seen with his game that we're gonna we'll look at a little bit more and let's do that. Um, move forward here, and we'll start with Pickett here. Looking through, this is an example of the dig um, earlier in the year against Tennessee, where he has this right here about to break yeah. open, and he just doesn't take it. He doesn't see it. Um, doesn't feel good about it. And then he sees a flash of orange. And I think that seeing that flash of orange creates a scenario for him where he winds up, you know, in a scenario where he decides to run and, and take it outside. And so we'll, we'll skip through some of this because we've shown that before. We're going to look at the next play. And you'll see he got better on the next play here yep. where you're going to see mm -hmm. him actually run this dig from a different concept. But, you know... He still does a nice job of now seeing the safety on the right hash move, you know, to the outside. He knows that's going to be cleared over. And he makes that throwing decision right at the, the beginning of the break. Maybe a little late by what you would like from an anticipatory standpoint, but he places it in the back shoulder away from the middle defender. So yeah. there's nice placement here. It's early enough, you know, and it, it's good work. Yeah, I like this. I mean, I, I like that this is an example of applying a mistake. I always love it when quarterbacks do that. And so you had the previous play where, okay, probably should have ripped the dig. Why didn't you? Okay. Now he's going to do it. Yeah. So uh, you got to be happy with that. And especially now that we look at what Mark showed with the Miami play, that he was very comfortable doing it with the Clemson play as well. Yeah. There were at least three plays in Mark's notebook that pretty much showed from different concepts, a dig route like this, where he had to layer it over coverage. So that's and I know that like it's like, well, why are you hopping on a dig route? So much too high coverage right now in the NFL. That backside dig. Look at Matthew Stafford. Look at how many times he threw that this year. Yeah. That's that's like the next sort of NFL throw. It used to be, oh, can you throw the deep out? Can you throw the deep comeback? Can you throw the backside dig? You know, I think that's where the league's going. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this one is more of a placement throw yes this is the one with with our not crawl the destroyer but um i don't remember the the other kid's name bartholomew yeah yeah and this is a nice throw because he sees right here the leverage of the defender trailing and he accounts for it and this is important because we're going to see later that he may not account there's things that he accounts for early in games that i'd like to see him account for when the pressure gets a little bit higher 
because this is one where he places it high and away, and he does a yep. very good job of putting that only where the receiver can make the catch. And so the fact that he can do this and he does it well is kind of a setup for some of the things that we're going to look a little bit later because um, knowing that he can do it, but then the, then when the pressure is on and he doesn't, that can be a red flag. That yeah. can be a problem. And that's where I'm at with this is like, can you know? Does he know his ABCs and one two threes? Yes. When it comes to throwing the football, you know, at the college level, the fact that he sees that and goes, it's got to be high and away, you know, right. because this guy's going to be able to recover and try and undercut this route. So I got to put it high and away, and it's perfect, absolutely perfect. And look at all the y yak he gets yep. as a result of that against a good athlete. So you know, that's a pretty play. Then we're going to see here, this is one that worries me. We talked about the pocket compressing. Yeah. And I'm probably being hard on him. But, you know, we're talking about first-round picks. We're yep. talking about pro quarterbacks here. And there's going to be a tackle in. There's going to be a tackle twist here. And with this twist, right here, you see this tackle work to the left side. And just look how far away he reacts to the sight of this tackle coming free. The tackle's like a good, you know, five or six steps away when you see, he sees this right here. Here's yeah. where he sees it, five or six steps away. Watch his reaction, ball out, eyes down. You know, he's nowhere near a throwing position. He's in a reactive state where now he has to, move he can't bait anybody he could have stood yeah. still he could have stood still and would have had room to spin to the outside um or slide a little bit more or at least right here he creates more pressure i understand there's pressure off the right you've got a defender here who may be free and what you have in terms of this dig is covered nothing's really open here but the fact that he's already reacted here i'd like to see if you waited here and he saw this come open. He could have waited a cup, maybe a couple steps, or climbed, you know, climbed a step and then been able yeah. to make a spin. He had options to extend this play and then maybe give his receivers time to reroute. Right. And so it's a, it's one of those plays that it looks difficult because there's three points of pressure here. Um. So even if he does avoid the first guy, he might have trouble avoiding fifty three. But he Can was you pause it when he starts to react. Yeah. That that ball is out. You know what my first thought was when I watched this play? What's that? His hands are big enough. Yes, that's a yeah, very I good mean, point. Look, I mean, <laughs> if you're worried about his hand size, like that's a moment where you put the ball out like that, it might just pop out of your hand. <laughs> so there's at least that. That's true. No, He's... but your, your point's about, you know, how he sees that flash of color that's that's spot on and i'm reminded of montana's book when he talked about how seeing and feeling color as a quarterback when you react adversely to the opposing jersey color flashing in front of you you know that's a sign that you're going to be dropping your eyes you're not going to just simply move and slide and keep your eyes downfield and look for that secondary reaction from a receiver and so you know that is a concern yeah. he's not going to have clean pockets to throw from all the time unless perhaps the Cleveland Browns make an intriguing decision at 13. I mean, yeah. other than that, he's not going to have those moments. So how he learns to navigate those will be critical. Exactly. And while this play, you could conclude, and I think safely, that he's going to get sacked either way. There's three yeah. points of pressure. Very rarely does a quarterback get away from three points of pressure. But the fact that he reacts as strongly to the twist – is the one that really bothers me because he opened himself up to getting the ball slapped away by the edge pressure based on the way he does this right there. You know, he's, yeah. you know, I mean, the defender's not close enough, but that's the thing that potentially can be a problem when you're in a tighter pocket in that scenario. So the fact that he overreacts there is a, is a bit of an issue to me with that. Yeah. And watching it right here, I mean, we'll see. There's that pressure right there, and he just feels that, and it's like, you know, just too much of a reaction. Yeah. So I don't know if he'd really be able to spin away here, but 
But I think at this point, I would have liked to have seen him try to turn that kind of reverse thing yep. around here. He might have had a shot to beat this end and get outside and help his receiver maybe reroute and be able to throw a ball. So moving forward, let's move on to the next. And let me look at my little cheat sheet here. Okay, this is a nice layered throw. We're going to see from, from Pickett, I believe. This is one that... Yeah, right in the middle of the field. He yeah. sees the seam route, but he know, but he also has a good feel for the safety on the opposite side and the underneath coverage to throw that ball so that the receiver can turn his back to the defender and make a safer catching decision, even though it has to be a little bit high. You know, And I think it has to be a little bit high due to the underneath coverage at the left hash here that he's got to put there. Now, maybe like you said, this might be the point where you go, does the ball fly out of his hand a little bit? Yeah. You know, is it does it have necessarily have to be that high of a throw? The receiver is kind of a shorty, though, so that might be – that's another factor that we put into that. But it's enough to a ask these questions. Right. Yeah, so – this Addison kid, man. Yeah, I mean <laughs> – he can certainly play. I didn't have it in there, but um, the switch vert against Clemson where he had to go up and catch it and gets blasted and somehow hangs on, such a great play. Yeah, Addison's – we're going to see a number of plays from Addison today. You know, yeah. this could be this could be like subtitled the uh, RSP. The, the early look at Addison. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so then here's another one that we're going to take a look at. And I believe, let's see. Let's see what we have going on here. Oh, this is a nice check down. So yeah. basically you see a th three reads. You know, you see him working basically outside in and then down to his check down number four here. And does a good job of being able to let that ball loose. And his check down is able to get yardage off of that. So let's see if we... I made this as a film room for people before me and Mark decided to do this. So, you know. So some of mine look like still clips right now. is because I had, like, stopped and talked and was going to diagram a bunch of stuff. And so that's probably what happened here with this particular play. Let's see if it'll allow me to go here. Yeah, so... He does a nice job. Even again, pocket compressed. He feels the, you know, he, he senses the color that he, that's a friendly color. He's fine. Senses the color that isn't so friendly. Yeah. Haywire. So, all right, moving forward. Here's the first of a couple of plays that I really like. And you're going to see that they take away the deeper range in the, you know, near the red zone. He does a great job of not wasting any time, just like you showed in the Clemson game, yeah. of being able to check down to his back in the flat, and his back gets the touchdown on this play. So it's you know a really nice example of him not wasting any time in this area of the field. And, and a lot of quarterbacks at this level do. They take a lot of time in the pocket, um, and they after they go through some reads, they don't figure out how to get rid of the ball or get rid of the ball – to an option who can gain yards. All right, so this next one, let's see what we got here. I believe this is another backside play. This is, it's three reads capped on the right side. Yep. And then you see him to the backside here. And so again, it's a good, you know, it's wide open, but it's a nice job to be able to make that decision, set his feet, Fire the ball to the you know the immediate answer there, and and it's really four reads when you look at it, because he's got the three to the right side that yep. is capped. Then he goes to the check down on the left and looks to the back, but the linebacker has that one covered. Yeah. So he does a really nice job of processing through basically five options on this play. Yeah, I mean th this is a great example, Matt, of like the stuff he offers from a mental perspective, like. You know, when you contrast it with Matt Corral, who, yeah, we had examples of him working through reads and stuff, but I think Pickett does it on a more consistent down-to-down -down basis. Yeah. And that gets you to the, okay, well, 
who's going to be ready week one? Who's going to be ready week two? You know, maybe you might think that Corral has the bigger upside, but if you need somebody now, this is probably your guy. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And then the corollary to that question is, who's the one that's going to make the who's the one that's going to make the plays for you when you need those three to five plays? Right. Who's the one that has the most upside to do that? And you might say, well, Malik Willis certainly becomes compelling if yeah. he gets his stuff together. And and there's some reasons to make that argument. But then there's some other guys too. There's all our pigeons here. In yeah, Pittsburgh. there they go. They're representing here. Um, and this was another play that I liked because, but it also points out something here is that you see the edge pressure and he climbs on this play. Yeah. Then he feels the mid interior pressure, brings the ball down, and slides outside. So I like the fact that, you know, against two points of pressure, you know, if it's in succession, he can find some answers here. If it's, you know, one point of pressure coming at a time. And it's not a, you know, highly successful play, but, you know, those he did have this route in the middle of the field, but I think the, I think the, the other color of the flock of seagulls over there, you know, basically, you know, distracting him. Yeah, probably, seriously. Probably, probably was part of that too, you know. So, you know, that's that's Pittsburgh's twelfth man is our yep. pigeons, you know. So, you know, any dig I can make it at, at Pittsburgh fans, I guess I I guess I'm gonna do. Got to get those in, man. I got to get a few in, you know. I mean, I haven't even mentioned Chad Kelly in months, so no, you haven't. You know, so there we go. He's he's been on arrears for paying me the, um, yeah, you, you know, those little benefits there. This is a pair of two plays that are nice um, because it shows his ability off platform um, and ability to throw on the move, and not just to his right. He's you know you got that edge pressure coming off to the right side, and he but I hate that he reacts to this like. He yeah. reacted to this immediately. He had, this is actually, this is before the two good plays that I was going to mention. He has a sail route to the left side, but he reacted so much to the right on this play based on what he saw here and with the safety's position here. If he had stayed where he was and let that defender get closer before he makes a move, he's probably going to identify that he has this, this sail route and probably yeah. a a good position to be able to throw this ball. Um, because even if he turns here, even though the, the cornerback's dropping outside the numbers at the 10, number eight, I think is his number here. He's still got to account for this underneath route. Yeah, number eight here, or number nine, he's, he's still got to account for the underneath play. So even if Pickett had turned to his left on this particular play earlier or stayed looking at his left, he's still probably going to get the sale route here. So again, that overreaction to pressure, that's the part of the game where you start thinking three to five plays a game where the yep. defense has an answer and it's not just all executing the whiteboard as everything's drawn up. Can he do it? That's where a guy like Corral is more appealing yeah. because Corral's going to say, hey, man, I may not get to the fifth read, but when there's pressure, I'm not going to short circuit either. You know, and this is not awful. I mean, he gets yardage. He's able to work away. But, you know, late in the game, you know, late in the game, you have a touch. This isn't late in the game. But if this were late in the game, you'd have a touchdown here as right. opposed to, you know, a first and goal in a more compressed area of the field where it's even yeah. more difficult, you know. So that's that's part of the thing that concerns me. Now, you know, fine. But that. then he does something like this and you're like, okay, well. And I think this gets to your point about when he knows it's coming, yeah, he's fine. Yes. Because here, there's every indication it's like a zero blitz or a single high blitz pre-snap. And he could see those linebackers coming. So he's like, all right, I'll hand it in here and get this out. Yep. It's when it's that unforeseen late pressure or flash of color, that's what gives him the problem. Yeah. And Bailey Zappi, to an extent, has a similar issue. Like, he's another player we'll look at where if he knows that he's responsible for the free blitzer, he's yeah. good. Yeah. But when a, a blitzer comes free in the middle of his process, that's where it can, things can get a little erratic. I don't know if as much as Pickett, but, it, but you know, the, the advantage Pickett has is you see some more of the NFL offensive concepts with Pickett. Yeah. 
that where you can at least feel like as a decision maker that he's a little more proven with the things that you you want to try to do. And this is another nice, you know, this is going to be the escapability that you like. Yep. You'll be able to throw off platform, find a receiver on that backside and throw it only where he can get it on, off platform. You know, so when you can roll left, make a jump throw off platform like that and hit a guy in man coverage, you know, you got to be happy with that. And then off, you know, with the sidearm delivery as well. Yeah. You know, that's there's a little Mahomes, a little Mahomes, Cutler, Stafford kind of stuff going on right there. And then here's another one just like that. But this time he scores, he sees the backside receiver in the end zone, finds him, gets it over, and gets it, I believe, yeah, just in time there before the defender, you know, is able to peel back and, and try and attack that. But I mean, Kenny Pickett. I mean, he's not a he's not a patsy in the pocket. He certainly no, can make no, things happen. You know, is he great in the pocket? He's got flaws. I'll put that. He's flawed against pressure, but he's good enough. Where, you know, if this if you have a good team around him, he could be good for you. Yeah. You know, I think kind of like Kirk Cousins. It's like. There, there's some things with Kirk Cousins where you go, oh, I, I hate it in these situations. He's prone to do some things. But can he be a 10, 12-year veteran who can go to Pro Bowls and, and lead your team to the playoffs with a good, uh, strong team around him? Absolutely. Now, this play, I believe this is the beginning of where things get kind of um, interesting to me because this is a second and 11 late in the game, fourth quarter, and just look at this right here. You got your safety to the near side right. You've got a man squatting down here. Yep. And that's the only coverage covering this guy on the left side. This is a streak up that side. Throw if you're Ben Roethlisberger in your prime, this ball is out. Like yeah. you are throwing this ball. This is a game winner. That you know, you can angle this ball to the numbers. You don't even have to angle it inside and get loft it. Your receiver's gonna be able to run under this. Your safety's gonna have no shot at it, and this corner's gonna be trailing. These are the throws that when you think, does my quarterback have that aggressive mentality at the point in the game where we can win it? And the answer here is I'm gonna check it down. I'm yeah. second, you know, now it's second and eleven. And he gets a solid five, six yards out of this play. And you can say, you know, live for another day. But, man, you had the winner right here. Yeah. You, you have it. And that's where I get. The, and we're going to look at the sequence of how this this drive unfolds. Yeah. Be yeah, I mean, that one's frustrating. You know, it, it does get us to the Baker versus Chef argument. And I was talking with somebody uh, who watched our video on Matt Corral. And he said, look, you know, I agree with everything you guys were saying. And then I look at Pickett and I don't think he takes some of those aggressive decisions. Pickett's your baker. Corral's your chef. I, uh, yeah. I mean, Pickett's going sort of by the steps here. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, maybe he doesn't like that matchup. But he checks it down. Okay. Yeah. And look at this play. And this is the next play. This is the third and five now. It works out for him, at least for this play, because he finds that open crossing route. And look at all the yardage that he gets off of that. Now they're in scoring position. So yeah. you can say, look, that worked out, but not so fast, because we've still got a couple more plays to go on this drive. And, and, and I would still think about the fact that he had the potential game winner and he decided to go for the the slow play. He he went for the layups rather than the game winner, and and here we are in one of these situations where he drops back. And he, whoop, let's get that where he drops back here, and he uh, and let's see what we're we gonna look at here. All right, so we've he's got the one safety high here, and you know look he looks to his left. He's got the receiver in the middle of the field, but he doesn't come to that until late. Nope. And he should have seen it. And he ends up taking a sack. And he's late to see this. And if you look at pre-snap, look at what's going on. High safety on the left. Safety's low, playing up near the box on the right. 
knowing yeah. who where your routes are going to be, you should know that the middle's going to be open. So yeah. why are you dwelling on the left side of the field against pressure? Yeah. You know, that's, you know, again, these are things he didn't do when you looked at his tape in the middle of games. Early yeah. in games, he does this stuff. He processes this stuff very well. Late in games, when it's vital that he makes the same type of reads, it's like a different guy sometimes, especially when pressure's involved. So uh, that's what concerns me: is you get one picket that looks good on paper, and then when the and then when the real play, you know, I don't want to say the real plays, but you know those those plays that have more weight to them, yeah, you know, happen. Now you're taking a sack. You had a game winner that you gave up, and now we're going to go to the next play, and that next play is going to basically show you how this game ends. Yeah, and it's not pretty because. This is a process versus results kind of moment. Yeah. And he throws this ball. And you could say, should the, the receiver read the coverage and expected the back shoulder type of situation here? I don't think so. I think he throws it behind the receiver. Yeah. And I also think that where he places it is kind of dangerous, even with where the defensive back was on the opposite side here. You know, the, the safety on the left. So... I think he's kind of predetermined where he wanted to go and he didn't he didn't throw it in the right spot and it and basically that seals the game right here. Yeah. You know, so this is where you know the quantity over the quantity when you look at the quantity of his tape, it's very good. When you look at There's the, an interesting argument I, I've talked to somebody that did some scouting for teams. And some teams really want you to emphasize with quarterbacks, third downs, red zone, third and fourth quarter. And I think from that metric, from that lens, you know, that concern about late game situations is a big one. Yeah. Now, you know, we're doing this on Wednesday, the 23rd, and you probably saw the interesting sort of fantasy quote question poll about, you know, you get a running back who gets you 25 points a game in fantasy, but it's only for the first half of the season. Then do you want him or the guy that gets you the steady 15 the whole season? Well, from a fantasy perspective, that's an interesting argument. From a quarterback perspective, if you're going to struggle in those high leverage moments, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I could get in the whole Adam Marsteads argument about this and how it doesn't matter either way for that answer. <laughs> yeah. but, but for this, but what you're saying, I totally get your point. And it is, and that's the thing. It's like, for me, I I think we can find lots of quarterbacks who can navigate your offense into the third and fourth, third quarter. Yeah. It's what, what happens here in the fourth. And again, here's one of those situations where when, you know, taking the pressure, he sees, this is one where I think he sees a flash of the pressure coming inside here. And you're gonna, and what's gonna happen is he's gonna have his right guard kind of peel off to the left. If he had waited another couple of steps before he decides to run, you know, I th or at least with this, I think the guy gets close enough. But what ends up happening is he just kind of drops and scurries as opposed yeah. to climbing. You again, you know, drops, starts to to rush as opposed to just kind of climb away now there's a backside defender in this position but it's still you know the it's kind of kyler murray-esque in that sense that kyler still does and he and it yeah. feels like he has some room here especially with 60 who's going to come across he had an alley here to be able to climb up yeah now maybe this backside defender gets to him but he had some angles to go to his up and to the right yeah all right so all right, moving forward. Let's see what we have. With I know this play. Yes, you do. This is probably the his throw of the tape of tape. Yeah, you know. I mean, this is this is the throw that when he gets drafted, this is the first one they'll show. Exactly. I think that's and, what I commented to, and I laugh. I'm glad you're like I know this the minute yeah. you saw it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's perfect on the move, huge spot, and we got to remember that Clemson game was his make or break game. Because going into that, it was like, yeah, you know, he's having a really nice season, but can he do it against a big-time opponent? Brett Venable's defense, that was a huge throw. And he had the fourth down throw a little bit later in the game 
you know, which was a very good throw as well. But that was that was his moment. Absolutely. Now, here's another interesting moment because they have the lead here in the fourth quarter. He rolls to his right. Remember that play where he throws to Bartholomew and the tight end works across and it's well placed and it's where it needs to be. You know, here he is rolling to his right, making a throw over a defender high and behind. These are throws he hits in his sleep in the first three quarters. Now it's intercepted. Now North Carolina is in a position to have a ball game here. Yep. And it's like, these are the things that I keep seeing that, you know, against them, against UVA, you you know, against Miami, um, where it's just like pressure comes, late game comes, and this game starts to unravel. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's move forward here from this. All right. Yeah, this game just starts to unravel. So here we go. This is a after the score that that North Carolina has, and this game is tight again, you know, you see him, you know, I think look into his, let's see if we can see how this unfolds. Yeah, just misreads the leverage in this situation. Yeah. This is, this should have been a pick six. You know, he was yeah. very lucky this wasn't, Carolina would have won this game. You know, I mean, you make this throwing decision Right here, what are you looking at? Right. What He's is, driving on that. Yeah. There, there's absolutely no reason to throw that. Yeah. So, again, these aren't plays, you know, if if your scouting department's looking at weighing quarters one through three as much as quarters, you know, quarter four with this guy, you might feel like you got sold a bill of goods in three years. Yeah. And that's my fear, you, you know, is with him is that – You know, looks good on paper, but man, oh man. So let's see if we can kind of move forward here. All right, UVA game. Yep. This is another one where, you know, late in the game, and we'll take a look at what we have rolling here. Let's see if it'll, I think I'm outlining that, you know, this is is late in the game, you know, and you see a nice little play action look. And once again, look at number eight. Eight falls down, stumbles yep. here, and he's going to say, oh, I got Addison right here. I'm going to throw this ball. We have a shot to win this game, you know, and I've got my man right here. Again, like the tight end throw to Bartholomew, leading the tight end, high and away. That's where it needs to go. This one on the move is too low and too inside. And look at that. That should be an interception. Yep. That is an interception in nine out of ten scenarios. Right. Or if you're going to be forgiving of a good wide receiver, maybe seven, eight, you know, six or seven out of ten. Most of the time, it's the this is game over here. But Addison, who this right. is an unofficial film room of, steals the ball away and scores on this play. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, let's take a, you know, see if we can get my turtle's pace of this thing going here where it'll uh, unfold. Yeah. So it, it, you know, just as this goes, the defender's in perfect position. He steals it away. And now the dagger's in Yeah. on this play. And but that's another process versus results thing. It's like, yeah, you look at it, he throws a game winning touchdown, but it's really Addison manufactured a game winning touchdown. Yeah. If you give this to Pickett, you've got the wrong idea without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. If anything, you have to mark Pickett off on this play because it's just the placement's awful. And it's, again, you know, the same tight end is right here. The tight end who he threw high and away against Miami where it needed to be, you know, he's thrown further downfield, a similar type of placement he has to throw and just completely whiffs on it. And yeah. it's his his bacon saved on this play. So yeah, this is like Jake Locke, or I mean not Jake, um, Drew Locke like, you know, yeah. in in terms of you know decision making on this play. So yeah, I that's kind of where my concerns are with one Kenny Pickett is just like can you know. Tell me, like, 
tell me why you would want in light of that like tell me what it is that you could see a team saying to themselves we're going to take him anyway I think it's the fact that you're getting an experienced quarterback that has a proven track record on film of doing the things that still matter for NFL offenses, figure out coverages, get into backside reads, get into check downs, get in through full field progressions on more pro style concepts, some athleticism to survive in the pocket, willingness to attack in the middle of the field, Whereas we know quarterbacks that can't throw in that area or struggle to throw in that area, they're a lot easier to defend. I think that's the picket argument is that you're getting the bulk of what you need from an NFL quarterback. I think the flip side to that is everything you just walked through, which is so then when it's 27, 24 in the fourth quarter, what happens? Yeah. Like that's the concern. And I think, you know, to bring up our friend Dan Hatman, if you're going to draft picket, you're going to your offensive coordinator, your, your quarterback coach, and you're saying this stuff with this repeated stuff we're seeing in the fourth quarter, is this stuff that concerns you? Is this stuff you think you can sort of coach out of him in a sense in that, you know, when we get to that 27, 24, four minute, 30 seconds left, we're facing 37, he's not going to screw it up for us. Like, and maybe they'll tell you that, yeah, we'll, I'll be fine. Cause We've seen evidence of him getting to check downs, get into reads when he feels like, look, you know, I can just get to that backside read or I can just check it down here. We're going to be okay. Then maybe that's a comfort and thought. And maybe that's going to be enough. It might not be for some teams. Well, I would like to thank Mark in advance for answering that question because he obviously, everyone here who's watched this knows that I just gave him the bad end of the argument. Um, and But he's the experienced litigator of the crew, so I, I felt like he was best apt to handle it. I mean, it's there's a lot of trepidation there. Yeah. I mean, because the flip side is easy. The flip side is he's the guy that's not going to give you the three to five throws. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because a guy you win games with, and are you drafting a guy you win games with in this class early? Who's I'm the last? Sure. Who's the last Baker who's won a Super Bowl? Mm. It's been a while. Yeah, I'm thinking Trent Dilfer. I mean, you could say at the end, Peyton. You could. You could. At the very end. You could. Um, but. I mean, you know, even Breeze was more chef-like at times when he won. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it might be Dilfer. I mean, it's I guess, you know, it, it comes down to where are you as an organization? Where do you think you are right now? If you're hypothetically Denver and you feel like we've got all the pieces, but you might feel that Kenny Pickett and what he gives you is going to be enough. But if you're a team like Detroit, that's a year or two away, you yeah. might take a bigger swing. Now, Detroit fans, that's a great point you bring up Detroit. Because, you know, Detroit fans probably up to this year go, well, it's going to be the same old Stafford when he goes to L.A. And he's, you know, he's going to let you down just like he let Detroit down. Right. But Detroit fans are jaded because as much as I love you, Detroit fans, and, I, and I'm a big fan of, uh, of a lot of what I'd like to see the team be able to do and watching Stafford over the years, you can make the counter argument to the whole, that, that whole Detroit thing and say, well, other than Calvin Johnson, he, I'd watch him make stick throws to receivers that, that would rival anything we saw this year that receivers dropped repeatedly yep. over yep. and over again. That would have kept them in games, helped them win games. So, you know, and people go, well, yeah, but that's too wild. You can't expect this type of thing. Well, no, those are the types of things you got to expect to see happen. So the argument is, is if you have a, if you're, if your team's not anywhere in a rebuilding stage and you're not anywhere near contending, either pick you make isn't going to help you right now. Right. You know, the argument might be pick other players. And then when you get to the window, either hope that the player that you draft the hope that there's a player in the draft who is ready to step in right now, like a Mahomes and within a year or two and you're off to the races and you're a contender for years to come or a Josh Allen, 
or you get a veteran you bring in you bring the manning you know the aaron Rodgers, the matt ryan you bring in right. the the established guy i just believe you know i'm hoping you know as a cleveland fan i'm hoping denver you know picks a guy like this you, you know because you know now as a kenny as a guy rooting for kenny pickett i hope it doesn't happen because i think that there's going to be too much expectation placed on him and it probably won't be the greatest um fit for him you know for it to work out you know because now he's going to have to be com competing against the Derek car you know the De Derek cars the the justin herberts and the patrick mahomes of that division yeah and he's always going to be come up short on that end you know so that's a that's concern for me so yeah for me i i get where you know to me it's like you have to say well we know we know what he can do. We're hoping that if he gets in a really comfortable environment, that he'll be able to mature and some of that maturity will be, you know, making better decisions that he's shown he's comfortable with in, in you know, the first three quarters. But I think if you're relying on that at this point of a player's development, um, it's too late. You know, some things are too late. I mean, yeah. You know, if you if you have the jitters now at this age and at this point, I think it's very difficult to overcome that. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is concerning. Um, and, you know, you and I have talked about three to five throws and all of that stuff. And, you know, I do think that there will be people that look at Pickett and say in this group of quarterbacks, like is being a, is being a baker enough? Like maybe this is the year to sort of take a swing. And we've seen Josh Allen and what he's done might lean people towards taking that swing on a Willis or Matt Corral rather than saying, you know, give me the guy that makes the th – I don't care about progression reads because it's my job to scheme the first guy open anyway. Yeah. So give me the guy that can create something when that first read isn't there rather than the guy that's going to go through the checklist and get to the fifth option I put in front of him. Let me get the guy that's going to create a second one that I didn't think of. Yeah, or give me the guy that, give me the guy that when he does learn what those three options are, that when when there is a hint of pressure, when there is something that flashes in front of him, that it doesn't disrupt the whole apple cart. That yeah. he that he's in a position to make a throw when the opportunity comes open. And I think that this is the tricky part of quarterback evaluation. We could go back to those beautiful spinning to his left, throwing off platform plays that he made. But is he going to be in position to do that when there's a, when, when certain things disrupt him easily, yeah. you know? And I think it's, a, it's one of those things that he's, he's good enough to play in the league. He's good enough to win in the league. Yep. Um, is he, but is he first round caliber, you know, ride your franchise ride or die with your franchise with him as with most quarterbacks in drafts the answer is no i think um until proven otherwise and that's easy to say from this standpoint but you know the good thing with kenny pickett is he's going to have an opportunity to prove it and yeah. he's and he's more than good enough to get to that point of those three to five plays to show whether he can overcome what he hasn't been able to overcome in the college game yeah i mean I'm excited for him in the sense of like, I think there's a good quarterback there. Yeah. I, I, and again, this sort of gets to, you know, when you and I do these, we have sort of different things that we look for. I mean, I tend to still gravitate towards the pocket passer guy. You tend to still gravitate toward, you know, yours is Bre your QB to save the planet was Brett Favre. Mine was Joe Montana. Yeah. Like I, I think that kind of sums up our, our, you know, viewpoints on the quarterback position, what we evaluate and what we look for and what we're excited about, um, you know, and there's more than one ways to win Super Bowls. You can win a Super Bowl with John Montana. You can win a Super Bowl with Brett Favre. I mean, so I'm still excited about Pickett, but I could see where others in this day and age of wide open offenses might say, you know what? I'll, I'll draft Malik Willis. And I'm really excited about him. And I, I think that, he's going to give us an opportunity to hit those three or five throws, which create secondary options that Kenny Pickett's not going to. 
See, I there's see now you've put me in a situation that I've got to reveal something about my quarterback to save the planet, which is that I never did re quite reveal this because I was hoping I would do it down the line and revisit it. But you know, I wanted to show the aliens Brett Favre, and then they would just assume that's all we had, and then like then the then I would have somebody you know that unassuming guy who's who looks like he's like ten into the Gatorade table is you know basically takes off his hat and uh goes into the blue tent and puts on some pads and then the fourth quarter pops out joe montana after brett Favre does something so you, you know i was kind of hoping he'd be my ace in ace in my boot kind he'd of be player the guy coming off the bench. That, that nobody knew i was cheating with him he just we'd just like sneak him onto the roster without like really saying much without much fanfare about it and then he'd just come off he'd just come off the off the bench and play um but yeah, I'm with you. And, and, and that's the thing. I mean, it's, you know, to me, and that's the thing about Montana too, is Montana was the type of guy that he, he did it more by the numbers, but he had a knack for being able to create. And I think that's, you know, that's the thing. Like, but you're right. The point is, is I, I want, I do find creativity a little more exciting. You find you know, being able to play within that structure a little bit more exciting. And yeah. and I think we're not too far on the opposite side. No, because we've really, we're I've noticed narrow. over the years, we've kind of come together on it because, you know, I've certainly, like, I remember the first draft cycle I was really deep into. It was the Goff, Wentz, Paxton Lynch. My QB4 was Connor Cook. Yeah. And I remember making the case like you need somebody to make a throw in an out route on a third and eight and hand in the pocket. Connor Cook wouldn't be anywhere near, you know, at the top of a board if I was revisiting that class now, given how I've sort of seen the position evolve and how you need to have that playmaking ability and that creativity. And I think you've also moderated a bit and that for sure you also see that like, yeah, you know, it's great that you can be creative and that's a, that's a must, but there are a couple of moments when you need to be able to play within that structure. So I think it's a weird thing of us doing these shows over the years. We've both kind of. Yeah. Moved to the I center. I mean, we're not here, no. which is why these shows are great. Cause we're like, instead of here, we're like here now. Yeah. I think that's totally, I think that's totally fair. And it's fun. I mean, it's, it's a fun way to, it's a fun way to cross check where we're at. And we're going to get yeah. to do that on, you know, a few more players. I think ahead on the schedule after the combine, we're going to be looking at Carson Strong. Um, yep. We're going to look at Bailey Zappi. We're going to look at um, Malik Willis. And I think we'll probably be looking at one to two more after that. Um, we got a we'll couple of we're going to drop later. Yeah, that I think we're going to we're gonna have fun with. Um, I haven't watched one of them yet, but I know he's on the schedule for this week. Um, for those of you who are ordering the rookie scouting portfolio, thank you in advance. I really do appreciate that. Keeps the hamster cage running and keeps the hamsters well fed to keep the lights going. Um, you know, so I appreciate it. you can find it at mattwaldman.com or mattwaldmanrsp.com if you want to learn a little bit more about it and why people like it. Um, and um, I will probably do a newsletter in the coming weeks about the projections. I want to wait till free agency to do any type of projections for the 2020 subscribers. Um, so it may be April instead of March for me to do this. And also because to, to be frank, you know, the RSP takes up pretty much all of my time beyond, beyond this. So I want to make sure I'm, you know, putting out the best product I can. And then I can go to the, per, um, the projections after that, after the dust settles. So, uh, you know, I'll have more communication on that for everybody. So make sure that people who weren't listening to this podcast get a chance to hear that. But uh, thanks again for listening. And uh, for Mark Schofield, Matt Waldman, thanks again. Have a good day, week.